Good morning. So I'm very excited to, uh, to introduce uh, the athletes that we have that are going to be talking today. Before, I just wanted to, to kind of speak to you about careers and transitioning. So retirement is inevitable that we all know for professional athletes. But the impact of the transition in sport often can be overlooked. Athletes struggle to cope with their emotional attachments into the game and change in their identity. In addition, those retiring young can face challenges in sorting through a second career or developing a second career, emerging into a family different, merging into different family roles and how that translates into how their family dynamics can change. Oftentimes, some of these athletes can face some mental illnesses as well. The panel that, we'll, that we have will feature WNBA and NBA players and coaches that, that will provide their perspective and how they handled their respective transitions out of professional basketball and also volleyball. Based on the model that ASP has established with the National Retired Basketball Players Association, ideas of how sports psychology professionals can best be positioned to assist transitioning athletes will be highlighted as well. So I'd like to bring the athletes along so we can go ahead and start this discussion. First, we have Johnny Davis. Johnny spent nearly four decades with the NBA as a player, front office executive, assistant coach, and head coach. Drafted after his junior year in college, he played for the Portland Trailblazers, Indiana Pacers, Atlanta Falcons, and Cleveland Cavaliers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, we have Kelly Schumacher. She is currently the team development coach for the WNBA Chicago Sky. After playing for the University of Connecticut, she was first drafted and picked for the Indiana Fever in 2001. She continued to play the WNBA through 2009, including two WNBA championships wins in 2007 and 2008. And she was also a professional beach volleyball player. I'm gonna sit along with them. <laughs> so before we get started on um, talking about your retirement, why don't you two give us an idea of what life is like for a professional player, maybe a day or a week um, during season and a day or a week outside of season. Uh, during a regular day when it consists of just practice, uh, pretty much we like to practice between like the hours of 10 and 2, would you say? Early enough that we still have a little bit of the afternoon to do something, but not too early so we can get our, you know, we can get some sleep because we also like the nightlife. <laughs> That's for sure. So um, basically practice, if it starts at 10 or 10.30, you gotta get there an hour early because a lot of players need treatment or sometimes you need to lift or you're working with people like me who are doing player development and working on skill development and things like that. Gotta get your shots up, you gotta get better. You gotta either keep your spot or you're working to take someone else's spot. So then practice starts and that's about two hours to three, just kinda really depends. And then after that, there's more treatment, there's more working out, there's more um, lifting and then you're off to get lunch. I mean, some kids, I feel like they grab one of those Gatorade drinks or something like that, and they go to practice. So a lot of times, a little bit malnourished. Um, so that's one thing as a coach that we gotta make sure that they're eating. But yeah, because we like to sleep, and then we get to practice and we're there for so many hours, you're starving afterwards. So then you go get something to eat, and then um, probably hang out a little bit at your um, apartment or house, and then go out for dinner maybe nightclubs, things like that. I mean, definitely when I was playing in the pros, I had a lot of athletes who just really like to be out and about. And not necessarily doing bad things or getting in trouble, but just liking the nightlife. I'm gonna do it from two perspectives. <laughs> the first being an NBA player. Um, as Kelly said, you spent approximately two hours a day uh, in practices, in, in a practice session where you're going over strategy, scrimmaging, et cetera. Uh, but the preparation for that starts earlier. It starts about, uh, if you have a 10 o'clock practice, you're up 7.38, getting yourself prepared to go into practice 
Uh, and then after practice, you also do your conditioning and things like that. So for a player, uh, once you've entered practice and then gone away from practice, the rest of the day is pretty much yours. Uh, those who are diligent about the profession, those who want to uh, enhance their performance, they practice a little bit longer. You'll see some guys will come back in the evening and, and do some shooting, extra shooting, things of that nature. But by and large, after the practice session is over, the rest of the day is yours. Now I'm going to switch hats. As a coach, you're there 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning for a 10 o'clock practice. You're having meetings with your staff. Uh, you're having uh, practice uh, planning in terms of what are you going to do today to move the team forward? What is it that you need to highlight? What is it that you need to work on? Once you do that, you go down to the floor and work with the players in terms of skill development. So from thinking about what you're doing to actually now going to the floor to uh, help your players become better because you realize that you are only as good as your players. I don't care how good a coach you are, if you don't have the talent, if you don't develop the talent, if you don't get their skill level better, uh, then you're not, you're not going to last a long time. After the practice session is over, you go back to talk about the practice session. All right, so it's the meeting after the practice session. So now you go back and you say, okay, what did we cover today? What didn't we cover today? What, what else do we need to get better at? So you go through that process. And then, of course, there are players who still want additional work with the coaching staff. So you do a little bit of that uh, as well. By the time you start getting ready uh, for the next practice session or the next game, you're looking at film, you're breaking down film, you're doing all of those things. So the people who think it's a, a job where you just come in for a couple hours, roll the balls out, pull them up, put them in the rack and go home, you are sadly mistaken. You will be out there from approximately 7 o'clock in the morning to probably no less than 5, 6 o'clock p.m. So it's a long day. Now, in terms of making progress uh, in your career, you want to be the first in and you want to be the last out. That's how you make progress in it. And you have to really enjoy what you're doing. And you have to enjoy watching the progress of the athletes. Thank you. I think going off of that with the enjoying what you do, I think that we all, as in our careers, we, we find that, that we have this goal and when we feel like we have arrived or we have established, correct? And so as professional athletes, you, you both have done so much in your careers. Was there a moment that you felt like you actually arrived or that you have established yourself? Uh, I think for me, it would probably be when I won my first WNBA championship. And the reason I say that is because I'm very goal-oriented. So this was the first championship that I won was seven years into my WNBA career. And every year before that, my goal was to be on the all-star team. And so I think when I really started to kind of let that go was when I found that I was successful in another sense. So winning a championship, playing consistent minutes on that team, and then in the fifth game, which was like the final, I played like 30 minutes. So it was then where I was able to kind of let go and be like, ah, oh, I've done it, you know? There's, there's not that many people who have done what I've done here. And so I would say that's where I felt established as an athlete. Um, and on the coaching side, I think I'm still working on it. <laughs> I think uh, I got the truest sense of validation as an athlete uh, my very first year in the NBA. I was 20, 21 years old, and we had just uh, won the NBA championship when we played the Philadelphia 76ers. And I was the uh, only rookie player who was in the starting lineup at that time. I had a lot of... Uh, confidence prior to all of that um, 
but I wasn't starting in the playoff series at, the, at that moment. Uh, there was another player who was starting, and unfortunately for him and fortunately for me, uh, he sustained an ankle injury, and the head coach, uh, whose name was Jack Ramsey, who's in the Hall of Fame now, rest in peace, decided to start uh, me at the, the point guard in place of Dave. And we were in the sixth game of a seven game series playing the Denver Nuggets. And um, long story short, it probably was the best game I had all year. 25 points, 10 assists, four steals. I can recall it just like, just like that because it was so important to me. <laughs> But uh, that, that, that validated me, I thought, as a player. And I went on to start the rest of the, the series and uh, wound up winning the championship that year. So that, that validated me, and that's, that's when I knew. Thank you. So looking back at your careers and the, the different hurdles or challenges that you had on and off the court, can you share with us one each that you, you both feel like you, that you experienced and then how you overcame that hurdle or challenge? Uh, for me, it was probably when I needed to have knee surgery. So after that championship season with um, Phoenix, uh, I knew, knew that my knee, you know, just didn't feel right. But I thought I was going to go in and kind of get a little what they call scope or whatever everyone was getting. <laughs> and I was just going to go in there, scope it up, clean it up or wh whatever they say. And then I was going to be great and good to go. So I finally was like, all right, I'm going to do the knee surgery this year. And um, when I went into the doctor, he was like, yeah, you know, it's kind of one of those things. It might work. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? It might work. And he was like, yeah, you know, most of the time for this sort of injury. And what it was is my patella was um, sort of tracking on the outside. And so it had grinded away all the cartilage that was to the outside of my knee underneath. And he said, you know, most of the time, we do the surgery, sometimes it works, the patella goes back. Other times, you know, it just kind of tr starts tracking back where it did and you have more and more pain until you can't play anymore. And I was like, what? So I always had uh, this, these aspirations to play pro beach volleyball. So it was in that moment that I was like, well, I guess this is where I retire from basketball. This is where I start playing beach volleyball because it's a dream of mine and, you know, I'm probably gonna have more and more pain until I can't play anymore. So I had the knee surgery, uh, I start rehabbing, and um, I was able to run. And here I am in Miami, that's where I had my place at the time. I would always, in between basketball seasons and stuff, I'd probably have a week or so in Miami, and I'd play pe beach volleyball, like that's how I stayed in shape. And so I was cleared to run, I go out to the beach, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna you know, give this a shot. And I start trying to move, and I can't move like whatsoever. I'm falling in the sand. And so um, I decided, what better time to go out to California? <laughs> so I go out to California and I start playing beach volleyball with some girls that I knew from college. And it's even worse there because the sand is like super deep and it feels like you're getting nowhere. I'm backpedaling, falling over. And I was like at the, just, you know, on the way home after, you know, going back to Miami, I'm thinking, what am I going to do with myself? Like, I'm to the bottom of the bottom right now. I can't move, I can't do anything. My goals, everything is like just feeling crushed. And I remember someone had given me this piece of paper with this trainer's number on it and uh, said, you should go see this guy. And I was like, well, I mean, I know how to train. I, I know how to lift weights, I know how to do this, I know how to do that, thinking I knew it all. But I'm on that flight home to Miami and I say to myself, you know what, I'm gonna give this guy a shot. I'm gonna give him a call, I'm gonna put a month's money into it. I'm gonna pay him, I'm gonna train every day and see where it takes me. So I call this guy, go in there, start training with him, and all of a sudden I'm playing like double days. I'm playing basketball, I'm playing volleyball, and everything's just like starting to come to its own. And so that's when I start really diving into the volleyball, I'm feeling great about it, and Bill Lambeer calls me. And he's like, Kelly, we need you in Detroit. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, uh, I don't know, I think I'm just going to play pro beach volleyball. And it was funny because we talk about that now, and he's like, I called you, you know, with a contract and everything, and you told me, nah, I think I'm good, I'm going to play beach volleyball. <laughs> and so um, 
another week goes by and Detroit plays Los Angeles and they get in this big brawl. I don't know if any of you saw it, but a brawl of women. Like they're all fighting on the court and everything. And like the Detroit team, I think like five girls got suspended. And so I get another phone call from Bill. And he's like, Schumacher, what's up? We really need you now. And so I was like, uh, all right, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so then I go to Detroit and I end up playing the last month or whatever of the season and we win another championship. We played Detroit when I was in Phoenix the year before for the championship. So you can just imagine the banter that went on the whole time between Bill and I, me having beaten him the season before. Um, but go on to win a championship and everything's great. And then that's when I finally ended up retiring and playing beach volleyball. But the knee surgery and getting through that and everything was pretty much the toughest thing that I had to go through. I think for me, the toughest thing was the realization that towards the latter part of my career, I wasn't as good as I used to be. And that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, like a, a, a moment, it's like someone throwing cold water on you, where you really know, if you're being honest with yourself, my skill level is going down. And here's how I found out. I used to practice with several guys, and I was known as a, a really fast player. I mean, I could really run. And we used to work out together during summer months in the off season. Well, I was into my 10th year at, at this point, and I'd never had any trouble from an athletic viewpoint of getting things done. But one day uh, during the off season, going into my 10th year, we were practicing, the two or three of us who would practice together. And at the end of each practice, Prior to that, we'd run wind sprints. So we'd run wind sprints, and I'd almost lap the field. I mean, I'd be, you know, 30, 40 feet in front of the other guys. Well, this one day, we went through our practice session. After the session was over, we go to the line to run sprints. And so we're running sprints, and we're going, you know, running suicides which is free throw line, half court, free throw line, full court. And as I turned it on, as I normally do, on that last full court sprint, where they would literally be at half court and I'd be done. Well, I crossed the line after going all out, and there was one guy right here on my right and the other one right here on the left. And I knew they didn't get any faster. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so it dawned on me that, wow, uh, my athleticism now is starting to, to, to go. So I, after the session was over, I walk into the house, and uh, my wife, who I'd been married to by then, I think 12 years or so, she sees me coming through the door. And, she, and you know, when you know someone and you're familiar with someone, you can read their moods, et cetera. So she, she says immediately, she said, well, Johnny, what's wrong? I must have had that look, you know, that look. And I said, you know what? My skills are leaving. I, I, my, I can feel my legs leaving. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, I'm not as fast as I used to be. <laughs> so we better start preparing for that next post career starting today. Uh, I, I say that, Wendy, to, to go into to this. I encourage all athletes to begin to plan your exit strategy the very first day that you are drafted or sign your contract because there, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on players who aren't ready to transition into the next phase of life. And you have to have a strategy uh, that allows you to alleviate the pressure and not have that concern. So when you're having athletes and you're talking to them about skill, skill level and personal development and, and those sorts of things, 
you also have to, I think, begin to talk to them about things that they think they, they, they won't ever reach this point, and they will. As you mentioned earlier, every person who relies on uh, physical ability, athleticism, that sort of thing, someday will have to change and shift into a different profession. Thank you. So my, my next question is, is kind of long, so, so stay with me. <laughs> so thinking about um, retirement, you both spoke a little, bit, a little bit about the different times when you started to think of this was maybe uh, the, when I'm going to retire. You know, as I was thinking about this panel, I was thinking um, I, I played basketball as well, you know, back in the day. Okay. I wasn't as good as you guys, obviously. Um, but I remember I had surgery my senior year in high school, and the doctor told me I couldn't play basketball any longer. Um, I, I didn't listen. I continued to try to play on in my freshman year in college and um, continued to force it, the issue, and I ran into a lot of difficulty with my ankle and, and ruined it um, quite badly because I wasn't ready to actually put up the, you know, the, the shoes. And so I wonder, did you guys have a moment where you think back to where maybe I should have listened two years ago or one year ago before you actually retired? Was there a moment there for you? I don't think I really had a moment like that um, because I think I went straight from retiring from basketball to then playing volleyball and now I I still think, well, maybe I could get in that tournament <laughs> and still give it a go. <laughs> but um, maybe I'm not really set in reality quite yet, I guess. You're not ready to retire? Yeah. No, I'm still <laughs> holding on. <laughs> um, I think around the midpoint of, of my career, um, and I played 10 years, I, I started to think a, a little bit about what I would do afterwards. Um, but I didn't give it serious thought until I saw those two guys next to me. <laughs> but um, I, th I think there's a, um, you, have to, you have to ask questions that are self-examining questions. <laughs> the biggest one is, what's next? Because at some point, again, you'll have to stop playing. You'll have to stop performing. And I think you have to have an area that you go to from there, something that you know you can count on, something you prepared for. And I think the biggest thing is you have to ask the, the what if question mm -hmm. as, you're, as you're going along in your career. And a lot of people think that starts at the professional level, but it actually starts at the lower levels um, when you're an amateur. For example, if you're playing for an AAU team, what if I don't make my high school team? What's my direction? If you're playing for a high school, what if I don't get a college offer? If you're playing collegiately, what if I get hurt or can't perform to the next level? What do I do now? And then if you're drafted, what if I sustain a career altering or career ending injury? And even if you last a long time, it's gonna be a short career. The medical profession, attorneys, educators, they, they don't rely on their physical body to perform, so they can do it for years and years and years. But athletes have a shelf life. You're limited in terms of how far you're going to go. So you have to prepare yourself uh, for that eventuality. And that's not to say you, you, you're, you're afraid of getting hurt or you're afraid of what's next. It's just that you have to be like the, the Boy Scouts. You, you have to be prepared. You know, as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking, you know, I've worked with a lot of athletes and I very rarely hear that coming out the gate. So I'm wondering, where along the lines did you develop that, that train of thought of, of thinking ahead, you know, preparing for the second career? Because oftentimes, um, I, I think you probably can agree, we're, we're having to push athletes to think about the second career in the middle of it, right? Yeah. And they don't come in. Sure. 
<laughs> they don't come in with the thought of what you're saying. You, you really don't. If. You think you're bulletproof. Mm -hmm. when you're, I can do anything. I can do everything. I can leap tall buildings in a single bound. That's, that's how you think as yes. an athlete. That's what gets you there. That's your, that, you know, you have to have that strength of conviction that, that whatever it takes, I can do it. That's what makes you special. But the reality of it is, you're only as good as your last game. As, as, as Kelly said earlier, you have to worry about what happens if somebody better than me walks through the door? Or what happens again if I, if I get hurt? What happens if my skill level begins to diminish? Those are things that are going to have to be answered. And the sooner you, you can get to answering or even asking those questions, the better off you are. Because when you're, again, prepared for the next phase of life, because it goes in cycles. You have, a, you have an athletic life, you, you have a peak, and then you start to come down. When you're ready to go to that next phase of life, whatever it is, if you prepared yourself for that, then you, you can look back on your career and, and, and have a, a, a degree of satisfaction and a degree of, of security knowing that Yes, I'm an athlete, but that's not how I'm totally defined. I have other things that I can turn to and other interests. And that's difficult when you're young and you think it's going to last forever. And, you know, you draft a guy, he's 20, 21 years old. He's making X amount of dollars. Life is grand. You think it's going to be like this forever. But the reality of it is uh, you, you really should start preparing as soon as you can for that eventuality that someday you'll be a former athlete. True. Kelly, you were agreeing when I was saying that. Did you go kicking and screaming in the retirement? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really think that I needed someone to give me the push into the right direction. But one of the things that I do remember is we had some kind of career meeting when I was playing my, probably within the first three years of my career, and so I wasn't that person who was planning or thinking about what I was going to do. I kind of just thought like I'd fall into it. I was thinking, you know, buildings and all these kind of things like he was talking. And it kind of comes down to when I was in that meeting, they were talking about the different qualities and traits that athletes possess. And I wrote a few down, um, competitiveness, drive, discipline, self-confidence, commitment, focus, time management. And I remember what they were telling us is that these relay into jobs later on. Like these are qualities that you don't let go, um, that you're always gonna possess. And for me, I always just kind of thought, well, I'm gonna get a job because I have the qualities that people are looking for to hire, um, but I don't have experience when it comes to a lot of the different fields but I'm gonna get a job. It just depends on if that's gonna be what I want to do, what I enjoy doing. And that's one of the things I think that people kind of struggle with in life as it is. You know, you wanna do something that you enjoy every day. So that's kind of the way I always looked at it and where I'm at today actually. And, you know, got offered a job with the Sky. So that's when I officially retired from beach volleyball and I really enjoyed it. I loved working with the players and it just kind of works into what my husband does. He works on the NBA side and then I work on the WNBA side so our seasons are flip-flop and then I have all winter with him. So it's kind of cool and it's what I'm really motivated to do right now. So looking back at the, the resources that were available to both of you um, when you were in the transition, transition from sport as you were retiring, so I'd like both of you to answer from different perspectives. So Kelly, can you answer the question, what, what resources did you have or maybe would you have liked to have had when you were transitioning from basketball to volleyball um, and then volleyball back to basketball? <laughs> um, and then just, you know, just retiring period from playing. Um, and then Johnny, I want you to think about, because your career is, like Kelly, it, it expands through the years, um, but you went from player to um, inside the office and then also coach. So there's, I think there's different perspectives. And so just wondering what resources do you think um, you would have liked to have had or what was actually available to you in that process? 
I think what was available is there was the NBA Retired Players Association, and they have a lot of things where if you become a member, they help as far as doing public speaking and things. That's how you know I'm here today. But then also uh, they do broadcasting camps, and there's coaches conventions and things like that that they help kind of like filter you into if it's something that you're interested in. And then um, also they have a scholarship programs that if you want to do continued education into something else. So those are the kind of the things that I've found that were available. But I think one of the most important thing is using your network. Um, the athletes, they're, you know, they're going to meet tons of people along the way. Staying in touch with people is huge because I found out when I later on I wanted to coach, I was reaching out to people that I may have not, you know, spoken to in a while. And it wasn't that, you know, I forgot about them. It just wasn't one of my strengths. And I think a lot of players that I know from the league who were always good at networking and staying in touch and things like that, things came easier. So I think that's the biggest thing for me would be to, you know, continue to reach out, get to know as many people as you can. And it, things just kind of like, I don't know, fit together. And there are, there are uh, a couple of things that, that you do have available to you. Um, one being the, the National Basketball Players Association, as, as Kelly mentioned, and then that's while you're playing, you're active as a player, you belong to that, to that union. And then afterwards, the National, National Basketball Retired Players Association, which is not just for NBA players, but it's for the WNBA, uh, Globetrotters, and, and obviously people who have performed in the NBA. So there's some things there, but you have to avail yourself of these resources. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, a lot of players, uh, especially early in their careers, don't, don't think they really need it or don't see the, you know, the importance of it. Uh, but there are things there that uh, can help you transition into uh, post-career opportunities. You just have to avail yourself of that and, and be mindful that uh, that's, that mechanism is there to help you. Did, did sports psychology or sports psychology techniques come into play for any of you, for either one of you, should I say, in the process of your careers and in the transition again? Did anybody expose you to it? Uh, I was exposed to it for, I think, a season or two in Indiana. We had a sports psychologist that would help us out. Um, but I never got really into it, to be honest with you. Uh, the one thing that I did take out from it, though, was the, what do you call it, vision? like Visualization? Visualization, yeah. And I think I started actually doing a lot of that. And I believe that's one of the techniques that kind of helped a little bit when I was playing. But yeah, not completely. I think when, when I first started playing, uh, sports psychology wasn't prominent with a lot of guys. As a matter of fact, uh, people thought if you needed a sports psychologist, it maybe there was something wrong with you, you know. And nothing could be further from the truth. Actually, they all need to have that mechanism. It's, it's vis visualization, it's performance enhancement. Speaking of performance enhancement, when I was first coming along in, into the NBA, performance enhancement just meant you needed to practice more. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't about some other thing you were taking, you know, that would allow you to play better, practice better, practice more. That was performance enhancement. But uh, today, uh, with all of these things available to you, uh, to have the mental skills to be able to, to know how to get out of a slump, to, to, to know how to be a good teammate, to, to understand how to, how to bring things together, uh, if you don't avail yourself of that today, then I, I think you're missing it. And um, I think each team, should have an on-staff sports psychologist the same way they do a nutritionist, a dietitian, a trainer. That component is, is crucially important. Uh, you would be amazed at how many athletes and coaches are really 
at the core insecure and not sure of themselves. You would be amazed. Some of the guys that you see on television that you think are arrogant and cocky, and they're some of the most insecure people I've ever been around. And they need that help even if they don't recognize it. And I think when you are a, a, a good sports psychologist, a good person in that field, you can help take some of the pressure off of a lot of the athletes and coaches who have those insecurities but don't know what to do about it. I think we could all agree with that. <laughs> So, Johnny, I have a question for you. Um, again, because your career went from playing basketball to um, being in the front office and coaching. Um, I, Kelly spoke a little bit about this, that she used her network into getting, getting a job. And how did you get a job after you stopped playing? Well, um, when I stopped playing, um, the president of the Atlanta Hawks, who's now the president of the um, Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, his name Stan Caston, uh, came to me and said, you know, I'd like to um, talk to you about joining the front office. And I think the reason for that was, um, I think he would observe how I was working with the other players when I was a player. I was kind of like a player, a playing coach, if you will. And so he just kind of made it official, like, I'd like to have you on the staff um, full time, you know, when you finally decide to, to hang it up. So he said, give me a call, and you know, whenever you decide you want to do that. But I think um, the most important thing, what has allowed me to have the longevity is that you have to be loyal to whoever it is you're working for. And I mean, you have to really um, understand who, who they are, what they need, how you can uh, help and assist them. I think the second thing is you, you have to have intent. Intent meaning purpose, like what is it we're trying to accomplish here and how can I best lend myself to that? And how can I uh, help these players be better? And how can I help this coach be successful? Or what can I add to this staff that would give us even more credibility or, or, or give us more, uh, a, a better chance to be successful? I think you have to have that. I think you have to have uh, knowledge. You have to know what you're doing. And you have to understand who you are and what you bring to the table. And, and uh, you have to be in a continuous search for additional knowledge to bring to whoever it is you're working for. And then the fourth thing I would say is you must have enthusiasm because if you don't have enthusiasm for the job and, and to, to get in and, 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 and get it done and like what you're doing, it'll show up. I, I, I've seen situations where people pull up to the parking lot and sit in the car because they don't want to go inside, you know, because they don't feel good about what's taking place inside. So uh, again, you got to be willing to put the work in be the first in, be the last out, and in between, do everything you can to help the coaches, the players, the organization, and everybody affiliated with it. Because when you're with a, a, a team or a group or an organization or a corporation, if you're under that umbrella, when they talk about that team, organization, group, they're talking about you because you're a part of it. And so you have to do everything that you can to be an asset and to help. And if you, if you keep that in mind, that everything is for the best interest of this team, this company, this organization, and you give yourself to that, it's amazing that when you are trying to help others be successful, how that same thing seems to come back into your own life. Sounds like a lot of it is just being intentional about the next step yes. in, your, in your career. Yes. So I have one final question for you two to answer. Um, what advice would you give the audience members that may be working with uh, athletes transitioning into professional, prof transitioning out of professional sports? Um, another way to look or to, or to ask questions to athletes as they're preparing for this, how would you 
or what advice would you give to the audience as, as to help athletes in that transition? I would say that uh, you have to ask the question of them, who do you see yourself being? What do you want to do? And uh, what is your plan to do it when you leave here? What is it that you want to be? You're all, you've already accomplished this certain thing as, a, as an athlete. Now what is next for you? And, and, and have them talk about that and discuss it. Where do you see yourself a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? Ultimately, who do you want to be? Where do you want to be? How do you want to have, what lifestyle do you want to live? And most importantly, what are the steps you're going to take to make that happen? And when you ask those kind of questions and then you allow them to talk and tell you, then they start to formulate the plan themselves. When do you think that dialogue should begin? The day that they're drafted. The, the very first day, that gives you a lot of time to work on it, uh, assuming that you have a long career. And when, when, you have a, when you have a place to land, when you, when you have a place, when you have an exit strategy, you know, there's a lot of ways to be professional. And uh, I think when you have that plan, again, it takes a lot of pressure off of, off of you as you move along in your career. And at some point, when you become a former athlete, a former player, that transition is a lot smoother if you know the direction that you're going in. It's just like you, we all today came here from somewhere else and we all had a travel plans. Now you wouldn't get on the freeway and not want to know where your exit is. I know with GPS and all that, you're relying on something, but it's best that you rely on yourself. Kelly? I agree with Johnny on that for sure. Um, but also I think helping them connect the dots, that was the biggest thing for me. Like I would sit down and kind of talk to someone and tell them, oh, I enjoy doing this, I enjoy doing that. And a lot of things that kind of come out were hobby oriented. Like I love building furniture with wood. I love making jewelry, painting this, painting that. Like I have all these things and creative aspect of my life that I like doing, but it's maybe a friend or somebody that you talk to who can connect the dots. Like, oh, you know, you could turn that into a business, you know, building those farmhouse tables or, you know, selling your jewelry or, whatever. So I think for me, it comes down to someone who can really kind of be like, oh, you know, that's a hobby. This could make you a business. <laughs> Thank you. So we would like to open it up for questions from the audience. me a while to get to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually do a lot of work with athletes as they prepare for that next step. And one of the things I'm often having conversations around is the idea of looking at that next step, but focusing on it. And, and the thing that athletes come back to me with is the idea of, of it being a distraction from their playing career um, versus having that outside interest be a performance enhancer. Uh, I'm curious what your perspectives on that and if you've had those same conversations and kind of what your answer to that is? Well, there's a starting point and there's going to be an, an end point. So they're going to get there it's at some point and uh, they may as well address it now. It's not a distraction. There's 24 hours in a day. I know you have 15 minutes a day that you could devote to thinking about your future, and, and I, I would sort of, uh, you know, put it in that, in that sense that, you know, this is for you. It's, it's, it's like an, an ATM machine. You gotta put it in to get it out. And um, if, if they don't apply themselves now, then they don't get to, to have those, those dividends that, that, that support later. Because when you start late, it's just like a retirement package. When you start late, you don't have as much in, you know. But when you're young, you don't think you need it. 
but if you do it while you're young, when you get older, it's there for you, and I think it's the same thing. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I'm Mario Henry from um, UCF. I'm an undergrad student, a senior. I remember being um, younger, because I grew up in Orlando, and I watched you as an interim head coach, uh, Johnny Davis. Uh, I remember, like, me and my brother would watch you, and you were always so calm. Like, that was the one thing that stood out about you as a coach. You were, like, the calmest coach I've ever seen. Um, do you think that that helped you or hurt you when it came to, like, delivering with the, the players? Because I hadn't seen that before. I, I always wanted to convey to my players that we were, that I was under control. Now, I know some, some coaches like to be a little bit more demonstrative, but I always like to think that I'm thinking about the next thing, whatever that may be. And if, you know, just me from a personal standpoint, I, I don't, you know, uh, I don't enjoy being chaotic. And I enjoy knowing that this is what I'm trying to do and this is how I'm going to do it. The uh, by the seat of your pants approach that just doesn't work for me. I believe in preparation and if, I, when I'm watching the, the flow of the game and I'm watching my team play, I'm evaluating, are they doing what we said we were going to do in practice? Are they carrying out the game plan? If not, who's not? What do I need to, to, to do or who do I need in the game that will put us in good stead at this moment? So it's an ongoing uh, thought process for me versus being emotional and reacting to every non-call or bad call that the official uh, may be giving your team. Now, there's a place for that, of course. I, I think it has to be strategic, though, that if you, sh if you demonstrate out of control as a way of coaching, I kind of think you might be that kind of person. You just might be out of control. And I believe that you should be in control and, and, and knowing what's next and, and have a purpose for what you're doing, even if it's undressing an official. Thank you. Hi, I'm wondering, as a, a sports psychology professional, we're always trying to figure out how to actually explain what we do to people and how it could be a benefit to them. Uh, apparently not everybody's as excited about this stuff as we are. Um, as yourselves, as you were players, in addition to now being in the front office and being coaches and mentors of now players, um, what would be your reason why you'd be willing to let a sports psychology professional come in and work with your team or to when, when you were in athlete mode to work with you? Uh, we get that you can't speak for the entire NBA, WNBA, but what would have been your personal why? What would have been the selling point for you? No pressure. <laughs> it's a hard one for me, no. Because <laughs> uh, I didn't come across it that much, you know? Um, but I think for me personally, it's good to have another avenue of someone to speak to and who can kind of try to clarify things for you. I think it would have helped as far as getting along with coaches and teammates and on that side. Or sometimes when coaches make decisions, to you it's baffling. You're like, duh, why didn't I play? You know, and you just cannot figure it out. So being able to talk to someone who could maybe be even have seen the game or know what's going on in practice, I think they might be able to give you a little bit more insight between the two people of what each other are thinking. Um, but also performance wise too, you know, getting out of your own head. And I think a lot of times that kind of comes up on what you're thinking and how you're thinking isn't helping you. And I think that's another avenue where you could help. I think that uh, players, coaches are all competitive people. And when you uh, say that your competition is doing something that may give them an edge, I think you get the attention of the people you're either working with or working for. Um, and sports psychology is an area, again, that um, is new to a lot of people but the competitive nature of, of, of people by and large, if, if, if you approach it that this is another tool that will allow us to be the very best that we can be, I think you get the attention of 
challenge the athlete and you get the attention of the coaches. Thank you, appreciate it. Go ahead. Hello, thank you guys both for uh, sharing your time here. Uh, my name is Manu, I'm a grad student at John F. Kennedy University. And uh, a huge theme we've been talking about is clearly the transitional period that athlete at every level will, will evidently eventually go through. So my question for both of you guys is, uh, as former professional athletes, you develop so many invaluable skills that do transfer over um, to your post career. So my question is, uh, at what point did both of you guys feel confident enough that those skills transferred into your, um, your next career? Okay. Um, probably for me, I was at the high school level when, when I knew that the, the things that were ne necessary and needed were in place for me to go to the next level and use those things that I had learned. Um, experience is a great teacher, and, and sometimes you have to go through the process to, to really know. But um, I, think, I think I learned it in high school. I, I had really good coaches in, in high school and, and teachers and mentors. And every step of the way, uh, whenever I learned something new, I, I, I filed it and used it later if needed. And I just think it's a continuous thing that you just continue to learn. You never stop learning. And, and you, should, you should never think you know it all and that you've arrived. I think you have to have a, a, a hunger about you for, for more knowledge, for, for better performance, for um, being a better teammate person, whatever, whatever it is, I think it's an ongoing process and, and you, you, never, you never stop. But for me, it started in high school. I think uh, definitely experience because I was confident to a certain extent knowing that, you know, these qualities that I have would translate over to, into coaching. But until I'm actually coaching and I'm doing the work, and the things that I thought I would be good at, I'm seeing like, oh, you know, people who've been in the business for years and years and seeing how they do things, I think it definitely comes down to actually experiencing it yourself to really see. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. Cool. <laughs> okay, my question comes um, from two things, Johnny, that you said, um, but applies to everybody. So you had said once, Plan your exit strategy the day you sign your contract, and even if you last a long time, you're gonna have a really short career. Um, transitioning from the, the player mindset to the front office and administrative mindset, how, c we know that as players, oftentimes I've, I've heard from players that I work with, I don't wanna think about the end when I'm just at the beginning. Um, I don't wanna think about that stuff yet, even though obviously we all know that you should. From a team culture perspective, from an administrative and a front office perspective, what would you recommend now that you're in this space to help teams develop a culture that gets people more connected to being willing to think about what happens next while you're still at the beginning? Well, I think that um, with a team, you have to uh, have strategies that connect all of the players and the coaches because everybody truly, uh, you are truly in it together. So it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a thing where you have uh, you over there and the, the you, they thing, it's, 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 it's a we thing. And um, I, think, I think you start with that early and that is culture building. And there are strategies involved to uh, take a group of individuals and, and, and turn them into a team. When you, when you watch the really good teams in any sport, you see a togetherness there that, um, for the winning teams I'm talking about, that they truly care about one another. Um, I had a, uh, a teammate uh, many years ago he was kind of like a, a father figure. He's a veteran player, but he sort of took care of all the other players. Like if a guy was going out to, to dinner or, or something and didn't have a tie, he would get him one. 
you know. He, he give him one of his. He was that kind of guy. Um, and th those kind of things um, develop, develop teams. So I, I think you have to start with that early, and, and you have to model it yourself. You have, to, you have to be the example that you want them to be and, and, and that you want them to follow. And I think it, uh, the sooner you do that and be consistent about it because players, you can't fool them. I mean, if you're doing something and it's not you and you're phony about it, they can, they can pick it up right away. They won't follow you. They, they won't listen to you. They won't respect you. But when they know you're sincere about what you're doing, even if you make a mistake, they'll hang with you, you know. So I, I would just say in terms of culture building, start it right away, be consistent about it, uh, and, and, and have it be just a, a part of what you do daily. And if you, you know, that old saying, people don't care about how much you know them until they know how much you care, that's true. That's very true. Athletes, they'll run through the wall for you uh, if they know you care about them. And uh, I can't even tell you how many times uh, I've drawn up a play that I thought would, uh, this play is just so great. And then they go out to execute the play and somebody went the wrong way and screwed the play up. And then somebody else took the play and turned it into something and made a basket and everybody turned and said, great play coach. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was somebody rescuing the play for us. And, and so uh, you, you have that, those kind of things and, and, and you know the media go and ask the guy and he'll say, Coach drew up a great play, so because they care about you. you know. Thank you. So let's thank our our guests, Johnny Davis and Kelly Schumacher.